play the record button for the session. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I am Felipe Ramos. I am the head of the Center of Economics and International Affairs at the University of Salvador here in Brazil. And today is a very special day for us as we have Professor Ian Shapiro from Yale University, Professor of, of, of Political Science at Yale, uh, joining us for a keynote address uh, talking about populism and the pandemic, economics, politics, and the current crisis. Uh, Professor Ian Shapiro is very well known for his scholarly work. Uh, for me, uh, for example, Shapiro has strongly influenced my own scholarly research, uh, as I am now, Professor Shapiro, uh, uh, working on my dis uh, dissertation at the New School for Social uh, for Social uh, Research in New York City, and my dissertation is about uh, how uh, democracies uh, can yield populist governments and how uh, populism can affect democratic constitutions. As you know, here in Brazil, we have President Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, that's kind of worse than President Donald Trump that you have in the US. Uh, so for us, it's very important to hear from a professor who is uh, well known for his uh, research about democracies and also about the, uh, uh, the, met the methodology to uh, uh, work on these kind of issues because I, I really agree uh, with you when you defend uh, problem-driven research instead of uh, a theory-driven or a method-driven research. So, uh, Professor Shapiro, for me, uh, uh, you are a very uh, important uh, reference in scholarly work. Uh, and we have now uh, our outstanding undergrad student, João Lucas Salis Santos, to introduce Ian Shapiro for our audience. Uh, thank you, Shapiro, and I give the floor for João Lucas to uh, uh, give your give his remarks. Thank you, Professor. Are you guys hearing me well? Yes. Great. So moving forward to a quick introduction about our honorable guest for today's event. Ian Shapiro is a studying professor of political science at the Yale University. He is the faculty member at the top notch of the said field and he is in charge of the Zonobo role since 2005. The professor also served as the Henry R. Luce Director of the Yale Center for International and Area Studies. Shapiro is a great name of the discussion in the academic field about democracy in its theory, health, and how democracy allied with justice should serve to avoid misdemeanors and domination. Two early landmarks of this section of his work are democrat democratic, democratic justice, I'm sorry, in 1999, and the state of democrat of the sorry of democratic theory on 2003. Recently, Shapiro also took part on notable analysis on the relationship between power and politics inside democracies, and on how power relations play roles in the economy. The professor also discussed recently about the resurgence of the right in the West since the meltdown of the communist system, and on how new faces of the authoritarian model are gaining force. While it, while it reinvents itself during the time, um, since the, the, the dramatic break on 1989. Furthermore, the professor has valuable works about how economy and politics work together. His most recent work, The Wolf at the Door, The Menace of Economic Insecurity and How to Fight It, is co-authored by Michael J. Graetz, is a huge met methodical work on how politics, policy, and political economy play roles on shaping the inequality on social stratus and building a fear atmosphere on necessary changes. Well, taking no longer, I would like to thank the professor again on agreeing to join us on the opening of, all, of our fall season semester this morning, and I'll give the floor to our guest, this professor, take on. Uh, well, thank you for that very kind introduction, and thank you for welcoming me. I was once in Salvador, uh, but it was many years ago. Um, but I hasten to add, I was there as a tourist, and um, I, I'm not a specialist on politics in Brazil. So what I'm going to talk about 
today is, uh, from your point of view, comparative. Um, I'm going to talk about what's going on in countries other than Brazil um, and some more general trends uh, in, in democratic politics, which have um, interacted in baleful ways with this pandemic. Um, so my, my plan is to talk relatively briefly. I know we have um, basically uh, about 55 minutes left. And my experience of Zoom is that um, long monologues uh, are not, not good on Zoom. Uh, so I'm going to make a number of, of points um, about the economies and politics of many of the advanced uh, and newer democracies and um, then open it up to conversation and discussion. Um, so that's probably enough uh, by way of, of introduction. Um, what I want to do is, first of all, um, talk about three facts concerning inequality and insecurity that pretty much pervade um, all of the advanced uh, capitalist democracies and many newer democracies as well. Um, and I think they, they shape, if you like, the kind of economic landscape uh, on which we are operating uh, in the 21st century and uh, it's, it's in some respects quite new and therefore upsets uh, settled expectations uh, about politics and the economy. So the first is that in almost every country, uh, inequality has been growing over the last 40 years. Uh, I know this is not true universally in Latin America and indeed in countries like Brazil, and Argentina, which maybe 15 years ago had a Gini coefficient of about 0.7, it's come down to about 0.6. So, um, but that, those are that's very unusual in today's world. Uh, and then secondly, even though those Ginis have come down, they're still extremely high by comparative standards. Um, so we're looking at a world in most countries we see if we look over the last century, we, this is from Piketty's book. Uh, it's actually from some of his research with, with Saez, um, Piketty's Capitalism in the 21st Century. And, and what you see um, is in many of these countries is this U-shaped curve over the past 100 years. So you go from what in the US, for example, if you look at the top line there on that graph, uh, you go from what we what was called the Gilded Age, very high levels of inequality. This is, we're looking at uh, the top decile, but you could use many other measures and still get the same shape. And then um, after the depression, uh, the New Deal, World War II, and the 50s and 60s, that inequality came down in many countries. And then since the 1970s, it started to go back up. Um, this curve is, you can see here, steeper for the US and the UK than it is for Germany and France. And um, I'll have a little bit to say about what conventional wisdom is about the relationship between electoral systems and inequality in a little while. Um, but basically, you still see in, in most countries this U-shaped curve. Um, so we are now um, back with, in many of the advanced democracies and, and some of the newer democracies, extremely high levels of inequality that haven't been seen for 100 years. This obviously raises the question uh, whether what we're looking at today is unusual. Um, or whether what was going on in the middle of the 20th century was unusual. Um, and that's very difficult to study because it's hard to get good comparative data on uh, inequality in the 19th century. Um, but for whatever uh, we, whatever we, we say about those questions, and I'm not an economist, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, try to resolve them, it's clear that we are living in a world in, in most people's lifetimes, 
Now, I was born in the 1950s, so we're living in a in a world which, for most people my age, there's much more inequality than they've known uh, throughout their lifetimes. Um, of course, the debates about the causes of go on endlessly. Um, how much of it is globalization, uh, jobs going offshore from the high wage economies to lower wage economies, how much it is uh, technology driven as uh, the productivity of technological innovation takes jobs out of the labor market completely. Um, and it does seem, again, to a non-economist that the main trend in the last decade or so is uh, that more and more uh, jobs are going to technology rather than uh, to globalization, and that the, this is the wave of the future. The, the sort of the McDonald's restaurant that used to have 20 people working in it uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, now has six people working in it, and five years from now we'll have one person watching robots making hamburgers, um, and that phenomenon replicating itself in many, many parts of the economy. Um, it should be said that the, the trend towards jobs going to technology is obviously being accelerated by the pandemic because uh, many firms are discovering the uh, technological benefits of uh, working from home, of doing uh, with fewer people in the workplace, and uh, some of that is clearly here to stay. So the second big fact um, about inequality is that in most of the democratic countries, trade unions have been disappearing. Um, trade unions, just, just to, this is one of the most dramatic stories, the US. Um, this is not just since the 70s, it's really since the 50s in the US. Um, the 50s were the high point of union membership, um, but that has become come steadily down. And so, you, you know, it's now uh, about 12% of the U.S. workforce is unionized. And if you look at the private sector, it's it's considerably lower than that. Um, it's, you know, 7 or 8%. So virtually the complete destruction um, of trade unions. Uh, again, the causes of this are greatly debated. Um, uh, you, you, you see it in many other countries, perhaps less dramatically here. Um, you can see, but you see that this, the red line on that slide is at 1980. And, and most countries have seen a decline uh, in union membership. Um, there are some, some uh, outliers. Um, you can see here Iceland has actually had an improvement in union membership. So Spain, uh, there's some countries where it's been flat. But this is the, the typical story is that unions have become less and less uh, um, important. Um, the debates have to do with, um, in the first instance, the, the shift from manufacturing to service economies. Uh, service sectors being notoriously more difficult to unionize. Then secondly, the, the greater mobility of capital rather than as compared to the mobility of labor. So you get the, the, the flying geese phenomenon of the capital flies to where uh, labor is cheapest. Um, so that's the globalization story. And of course, um, the technology story plays into that as well because machines don't join unions. Um, so uh, this has been a, a huge consequential fact in many of the advanced democracies and um, greatly affects uh, politics because it means that unions essentially defend shrinking labor forces less well. They have less leverage in the bargains that they strike with capital, and they also, um, uh, because they're representing smaller and smaller sectors of the workforce, um, they defend uh, fewer and fewer people, even if they even if they defend the ones that they do defend less well. Again, then this is there's some contrarian trends in Latin America, 
um, but uh, in most of the developed democracies, uh, unions are, are sh weak and shrinking and unlikely to get stronger uh, given developments in the economies. Um, and so many scholars speculate that there's a relationship between the growth of inequality and the decline of unions because um, the political efficaciousness of unions is on the wane. Um, and so uh, people explore this relationship. Uh, again, this is from the US. You can see here that the, the middle class share of incomes has basically fallen uh, as union membership has fallen um, and as uh, the wage stagnation of the middle class has been um, precipitous, again, in many, many countries. Um, so that's the second. And then the third fact is, um, I think, also tremendously consequential, both for economics and for politics, which is that long-term job security has vanished and it's not coming back. So it'd be the case that, um, it used to be the case that uh, in, in the advanced uh, capitalist democracies, people completed their education, whether at a high school level or, or university, then got a job, worked in that job for 30 years, and uh, retired on a pension. Today, uh, this is a study of baby boomers in the US. Uh, people um, born in the, in the late 50s and early 60s um, changed jobs between 12 and 15 times, 12 and 14 times um, during their lifetimes. And so this is, this is again, um, an artifact of the uh, rapid innovation and change in, in uh, capitalist systems, the uh, constant obsolescence of many lines of production as multiple causes. But what it means is that people have to anticipate losing their jobs multiple times over their lifetimes. And this is greatly what has contributed to um, the, the, the decline in middle class incomes, because often we, through the process of de-skilling, people move from better paying jobs to poorer paying jobs. Uh, from uh, jobs with benefits to jobs with no benefits, uh, to full, from full-time jobs to part-time jobs. And so while, uh, while it is true that uh, people who, who speculate that, you know, they're just not going to be enough jobs uh, because everything's going to technology are probably wrong. David Autour and other economists uh, make a pretty powerful case that there will always be new lines of production and that on net jobs are not disappearing. However, good jobs are disappearing. And um, this contributes to the decline of um, middle class incomes uh, as people go from one family earner to two in order to maintain the same family income and uh, take these, these less good jobs. Um, so those are the three economic facts I wanted to point to. And now I want to uh, talk about two political, big political facts. Um, now my slides are no longer going forward though. For some reason my slides are stuck. Uh, let me see if I can. I may have. Hang on. Yeah, How? if it's okay, okay. I got it. it works. So problem solved. So I want to talk about two facts about democracy, and then I'm going to stop and open it up. So the first is that um, if you in just about every democratic system, parties have become more fragmented. What do I mean by fragmented? This is, a, this is some empirical work we're doing um, uh, on uh, democratic governance. 
And this is data from 26 OECD countries from 1960 to the present. And we're looking at the number of parties in the legislature. Um, this is uh, the number of effective parties and the raw number. Effective just, con just controls for their size. But what you can see is that the, the number of effective parties um, has gone from, you know, um, under three uh, to over over four. I, I'm sorry, from under yeah, from under three uh, to to over four, and that means that um, there are more parties in the legislature uh, of almost all of these countries. Uh, and oftentimes, what you find is that it, the, what's happening is that the mainstream parties are hemorrhaging support to parties on their fringes. Uh, this is especially pronounced on the left. So if you look at the if you look at um, fragmentation of left parties in in this in this data set, you see that although the the left vote share that's the black line over there has remained more or less constant, come down a little bit since 2010. Um, but the fragmentation of left parties has gone up. Um, uh, and that, that indicates that the traditional sort of social democratic left of center parties have been hemorrhaging votes. Um, we think, and this is what we're studying now, um, that it's connected to the disappearance of industrial jobs, and they're connected with that, of course, the decline of unions. As, as, as jobs disappear, what you find is that the effective number of left parties fragments. Um, and and it, it stands to reason, if you think about it, that the, the left of center parties were closely linked to the union movements and organized labor, but as they are shrinking, uh, the, and the voters that they can protect uh, are a smaller group, then um, uh, you should expect the disaffected voters to be up for grabs by other parties. There's also fragmentation on the right, but it's less, um, it, it follows a less systematic trend, and certainly, say, since 1990, on the middle of that graph, um, one could think that it, the, the fragmentation on the right has been um, pretty flat. It's not the same kind of trend line. And so uh, this connects again to populism. Where is the far, where is the far right um, vote going to? Whereas on the left, it's going to, say, in Germany, parties like Der Linke, um, the Greens, um, and so on. Uh, you can see, if, if you look at the alternative for Deutschland, which is on the blue in the middle of that slide, that they have been picking up votes from the mainstream parties, uh, from people who've never voted before, and even some, uh, from, even some from the SPD, which is the center-left party in Germany. And so um, disaffected voters who are left behind in the new economy are up for grabs and are easily mobilized by parties on the fringes, um, as we see here in this slide showing the, the, the change in Germany between 2013 and 2017. So that's one, one fact about parties. And I, I showed you that picture from Germany. I could have showed you a similar picture from many other countries. Then the other big trend in democratic politics over recent times is that parties have become much weaker. They become internally less coherent and um, less able, therefore, um, to function as units, to function as teams. Um, how, how have parties become weaker? They become weaker um, through things like the direct election of party leaders by members um, who tend to be on the fringes of the parties. So, for instance, in Britain, uh, the Labour Party has 450,000 members, but they're well to the left of the typical Labour Party members. So they'll elect somebody like Jeremy Corbyn, um, 
But the Parliamentary Labour Party, which is much closer to the median voter in, in the UK, couldn't govern with his platform and get re-elected in their districts. And so you get the kind of train wreck we saw for Labour in the British election recently. More and more um, reliance on ballot initiatives, referendums and plebiscites, which pull the rug out from political parties by, um, with initiative on things like tax cuts or anything that intense minorities want, uh, making it very much more difficult for parties to govern. Fixed parliaments and term limits uh, have the same effect of, of diminishing, um, diminishing the, the uh, authority of the leadership of parties in parliaments to set agendas. The preference for open list PR over closed list PR, which again, has that same effect um, of diminishing the, the authority of the party leadership and promoting uh, celebrity candidates, candidates who promise uh, things to narrow constituencies and get away from programmatic legislation. The trend to strengthen presidents everywhere as legislatures become more and more dysfunctional we think because the, the, the legislative parties have become weaker, um, so it's, it's attacking the wrong problem to strengthen presidents, which just further weakens them. Um, and then increased use of primaries and caucuses. And there the same, the same issue arises, as I mentioned, with the Labour Party in the US, that the thing about primaries and caucuses is that they have very low turnout events and they tend to be activists on the fringes of parties. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to skip through this slide. But so if you, this is a, for a two party system, um, but it's true wherever parties are large. Um, if we think about a primary election uh, among the parties, the, the obviously the candidates have to move you would think toward the median voter in the party, the A and B there I put for the left party and the right party to, to win the primary. But in fact, that's not even the case because the turnout in these primaries is on the fringes of the parties. So it's really on the, the dark blue and the dark red that the people who show up. So just to give you one example from the US in 2016, Donald Trump was selected as the Republican candidate by fewer than 5% of the US electorate. Um, so what happens is um, primaries empower uh, the fringes of the parties. Uh, the same thing is true in legislative parties. In the US, we've had primaries for over 100 years in the legislature, but we have more and more and more safe seats. And of course, in a safe seat, the only election that matters is the primary. And that's how the Tea Party was able to take over so much of the Republican Party after 2009. That's how um, you get more and more gridlock because both parties are controlled on their flanks. Um, and that makes it very difficult for them once in government uh, to govern because uh, either they're going to move toward the median voter, in which case, they're going to get attacked again in a primary, or they're not, and then you're going to get gridlock. So, so the fragmentation of parties in multi-party systems, the weakening of parties in in all in many systems, uh, contributes to the inability to govern, and that opens the way for uh, anti-mainstream candidates and and even anti-system parties to gain purchase with voters. Uh, and uh, run on, you know, as Trump did, only I can fix it. Strongman policies and um, uh, uh, in engaging in politics that, uh, that uh, play to the dissatisfaction of voters, particularly those who've been left behind because of the economic factors I pointed to in the first half of my lecture. And those are the people who can be mobilized uh, for the fringes of these parties. So that is the, that is the rather depressing uh, position in which we find ourselves. And the answer has to be 
starting with uh, the people who have been harmed by globalization and jobs going to technology and the continuous obsolescence of modern technology. Because the more those people are left behind, the more easily they will be mobilizable um, in this, in, by these extreme groups. And that's what my new book with Michael Gratz that was referenced in the introduction is about what sorts of policies might work uh, from the, the point of view of uh, addressing those insecurities. So why don't I stop there and uh, open it up. I see it, we're, we're at, at pretty much at 30 minutes and uh, I've, I think I've, I've spoken long enough. So I'm gonna try to unshare my screen if I can figure out how to do that. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Shapiro. It was an excellent starting point for our conversation. Uh, we already have uh, a question here uh, from the audience and you have the students, uh, Gabriel and Diego, to help us to uh, read aloud the question for you. Uh, and before uh, uh, giving the floor for the students to coordinate this, I would like to raise my uh, own question for you. Um, and people, please, people, we have people from all of Brazil here, from other universities. Uh, you will be able also to uh, open up the microphone and, and turn it on to speak to the professor directly. Uh, but first, I'd like to, uh, to raise this issue, Professor Shapiro, for you. Uh, we have read for decades a lot of scholarly work on the need to deepen our democracies, to open venues for participation, like referenda, plebiscites, um, and even these uh, very uh, points that you raise that have weakened uh, the parties, the political parties, like uh, open lists and to fix uh, term limits uh, for parliamentary uh, participation and primaries and caucuses. So all of these things would be uh, good or health, healthy for democracies. And now we have seen some uh, some downside consequences of this very process of uh, democratization. So uh, even Professor uh, Professor Stephen Levitis and uh, the co-author of the How Democracies Die, uh, Zeiblatt, uh, have discussed how uh, the the absence of uh, uh, super delegates in the Republican Party. Uh, yelled the, 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 the pathways to Trump to win uh, the primary in the Republican Party. So uh, there was no uh, break to stop Trump to rise uh, inside the, the, the Republican Party in the US. So is it not a good thing to be too democratic? This is my question. So uh, democracy, too much democracy is bad for democracy itself. So uh, I think that's not quite the right question. Uh, it's a question is what kind of democracy and where, where in the system is democratic participation good and where is it, where is it harmful? Um, you know, the, 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 that's a great book, The How Democracies Die, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't ask the question, why do democracies die? Uh, and it, it has nothing to say on that. Uh, I, you know, the, the, the book of mine that's relevant to this discussion is my book with Francis Rosenbluth called um, Responsible Parties, um, Saving Democracy from Itself, Yale Press 2018. Um, but so uh, basically what we, what, what we argue, and um, I, I would argue it even more strenuously today than I did in 2018, is that um, when, you, when you say, uh, yes, you need more democratic control of political parties because the people should have a, a larger say, the question to ask is which people? Um, because if, if you um, think about, think about uh, referendums, for example, you brought up referendums. Um, 
Uh, I apologize for taking so many of my examples from the U.S., but um, it's you know they're the ones that come to mind. And as I said, I'm I'm not an expert on Brazilian politics. So if you ask American voters, would you like a tax cut? You 70% will say yes, no matter what what tax, even the estate tax, which is paid by the top 2% more than half of it's paid by the top of half of 1%, people with estates of more than $20 million. It's the most progressive tax in the US tax code. 70% will say yes. If you say to them, would you like a tax cut if it means getting rid of, of uh, free prescription drugs for senior citizens, which is in uh, part of Medicare, then they say no. Okay, so what's going on there is in the first case, they're saying, yes, well, yeah, sure, why would I want a tax cut? In the second case, they're being forced to discount their preference for a tax cut by their preference for keeping pre free prescription drugs for senior citizens. And then they come out somewhere else, right? So that's what parties do. They bundle issues together and they have to discount everything they propose by the other things that they propose um, in, and come up with a platform that they think is good for as many voters as possible that they are trying to attract. Now, if you allow somebody to, as happened in California in 1978, famously Proposition 13, the anti-tax lobby just put down a referendum on the question, shall we stop all taxes on property from being more than 1%, right? So you can only tax up to 1% of the value of a house, whether it's a, a tiny little um, cottage or a multi-million dollar mansion. Well, what happened? Two thirds said yes. Um, but then over the next several decades, this has bankrupted the state of California. It's made their, their educational system go, uh, go to hell. It, it has um, undermined local government services uh, and so on and so forth. So if you allow um, intense single issue groups uh, to pursue what they want through, again, referendums often have extremely low turnout. Um, they can just externalize the costs of what they want onto everybody else. And you have the kind of governance that doesn't do the bundling that um, is, is what parties are supposed to do. So that, you know, you, is, it, is it more democratic to allow uh, that to happen in California? In fact, once that happened in California, and it was the beginning of the anti-tax movement. And uh, it was copied in, you know, 30 other states. Um, and so you've got, you had these huge fiscal crises in all of these states. Um, and so that's, that's one example. But I think it makes the point quite dramatically that unbundling platforms and giving more direct voter control sounds great, but it's not necessarily a good thing at all. Thank you, Professor Shapiro. So we have some questions from the audience. Uh, Gabriel or Diego, Johan or Jean-Lucas, one of you can read it aloud, please. The I'll take it. I'm here already, so okay. I might as well take it to optimize the time. So our first question, Professor, is from Angela de Castro. She is from the University of Brasilia. She said that, first of all, she would like to thank you for your presentation, and uh, it's an honor to be watching your lecture. And she would like to ask you if because of this process of weakness of political parties, we are opening more and more space to the rise of populist leaders. And what can be done to stop the rise of so many populist leaders and parties? Yes, thank you very much. Well, so the short answer is to strength, we need to strengthen political parties. Uh, the, the longer answer is that's extremely difficult to do. Um, because once they have become so weak, it's the, the problem is sort of putting the toothpaste back into the tube kind of problem. Uh, you mentioned earlier in your previous question the, the issue of the superdelegates. But the superdelegates are a band-aid on a bad system, 
right? Why, why were there superdelegates in the U.S. system? It was because in the 1970s, um, there was something called the McGovern-Fraser reforms of the Democratic Party, which the Republicans then copied, which basically, you know, they said, oh, smoke-filled rooms, uh, elites are controlling the parties, we've got to We've got to have much more direct participation in controlling the parties. And so uh, they did that and they made primaries much more important, for example, uh, in both parties. And then what did they discover? They discovered exactly what I said to you in my lecture, that the parties were being controlled by people on the fringes of the parties and they needed to counteract that. And so they put superdelegates in, um, which were essentially uh, go to the conventions and could vote differently than the um, than what had come out in the primaries. Um, but of course, then that bred its own critique. Oh, the superdelegates are are elites. You know, it's the will of the people is being frustrated, and, and that whole narrative. Um, and so then they began disempowering the superdelegates. So what happened in 2016? Um, the Republican Party had made their superdelegates uh, powerless by saying that on the first round they would be bound by whatever came out of the primaries and they could only vote how they wanted if uh, it went to a second round. Well, no American party has gone to a second round for many decades. So in effect, what it meant was they couldn't stop Trump. Uh, um, but, you know, uh, just to underscore how difficult this is, after 2016, what did the Democrats do? Well, the only way that uh, uh, Hillary Clinton could get the Sanders people to support uh, her platform in 2016 was to agree to agree to put in reforms to the Democratic Party that would also disempower the superdelegates, which they have now done. So uh, the the way is now open for the same kind of populist takeover of the Democrats at some future time that Trump did with the Republicans. But unless unless you strengthen the, the legislative parties um, and make it more possible for them to govern, uh, it makes it easier and easier for populist figures to say, oh, the whole system is dysfunctional and corrupt and only I can fix it. Um, and so um, I, I won't go on too long, but I'll give you one more example from the US. As you probably know, because of our electoral college system, it's possible that you can l lose the popular vote and win the election. Right. So that's what Trump lost the popular vote by three million, but he still won the election. So now people are all running around saying, oh, we should get rid of the Electoral College. We should have direct election of the of the president. Um, but of course, that would make the U.S. function more like a Latin American system. It would strengthen the independent legitimacy of the president. Say, I represent the people. I've been directly elected by the people. Um, Whereas, in fact, they should go back to the system they had in the, in the first part of the 19th century when the congressional parties chose their presidential candidates, and that made the U.S. system function more like a parliamentary system. Um, but un unless and until you can strengthen the parties in the legislature, it's going to be impossible uh, to uh, immunize systems from populist candidates running, um, selling snake oil and promising the impossible and accumulating power as they do it. Next question. Uh, okay, good morning. I'm Diego and I'm going to read the question from Amanda Vitoriano. Hello, Professor. May I ask you, how, uh, considering how the technology is taking up the job market, what are the alternatives that governments around the world can apply on the countries to help its economy, make the job market wider, and elevate the income of its population? 
can the instances of technological studies to help the maintenance of this more recent way of production be a solid alternative, or is it better and incentivate innovation and expect a new way of production for the capitalist system? Um, so I didn't hear all of that, but I'll answer the part that I did hear. The audio wasn't very clear to me. Um, so as I understand it, it's, you know, in the world we're going to be living in for the next several decades at least, um, more and more jobs are going to technology. And so what does that mean for employment? Um, so I think this is where the Nordic countries have the best approach. Countries like Denmark, they have, um, they have very robust systems for retraining people who lose their jobs, supporting them during transitions, and getting them back into the workforce. Um, the US has one of the worst systems. Um, we have a whole chapter about why it's bad in the US and what could be done to improve it. But um, we have to get away from the assumption that people are going to get educated to the point that they need for their working lives uh, by the time they finish either high school or university. Because um, in fact, they're going to need to be retrained multiple times. And so you need uh, you need a system of support for that. Um, and uh, that means um, we, we call it universal adjustment assistance to replace trade adjustment assistance. Trade adjustment assistance is just for people who lose their jobs to globalization. But that's less and less the, the issue anymore. It's more and more uh, technology and just the mob mobility of capital even within countries. Um, the, the, the alternative to that is that um, in the U.S., what, what it means is people just become permanently unemployed uh, or they go on Social Security disability insurance, which is um, extremely expensive. And they can go on that, you know, they can find a doctor to say they're disabled when they're 45 years old, and then they never come off of it. So it's, it's one of the most expensive and unproductive ways to serve people. Um, so we argue for a much more robust training and retraining system along the sort of Danish model. And it should be funded by business because a well-trained workforce is a subsidy to business. And um, the, they're, they're reaping you know, huge benefits. They should actually see that it's in their interest. Um, and the, our book is in many ways aimed at business elites as much as, a, as anybody else. They should, they should understand that it's in their interest to have a well-trained workforce and that some of the, the massive, you know, we all know from Piketty and others that the, the returns to capital exceed the returns to other factors of production. And the, the returns to capital are enormous um, in this world. And some of those returns should be funding this because if they don't do it, um, these are the people who are going to be mobilized by populist politicians. If they can't be retrained, if they, if they have no prospects, if, they, if they're downwardly mobile. Um, I think a lot of business leaders in the West were very complacent after the collapse of communism because they thought, you know, capitalism is the only game in town. Uh, we don't have to worry about disaffected workers anymore uh, as they did during the Depression when there was a an alternative out there competing for the hearts and minds of American workers. So, you know, we can just ignore those people, kind of move to the suburbs, build more prisons, out of sight, out of mind. Now they see post-2016 that, you know, these people can be mobilized for kinds of policies that business will not want to live with, protectionism, um, uh, for example, um, and uh, uh, strongman militarist uh, uh, politicians. So uh, we argue that that's the kind of thing that that needs that needs to be done, and we think that uh, you know th there are very few good effects of 2016. But um, uh, we think that among the good effects is that it hopefully is a wake up call 
for complacent elites who have uh, not understood that it's in their interest to pay attention to the bottom, uh, you know, two quintiles of the electorate. Morning, Professor. Thank you again for joining us. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So next question is a question sent by Pedro Azevedo, and he says, First of all, I would like to thank you for your time with us here today. During, during the pandemic, we've seen examples of the degeneration of democracy into arbitrary rule, most evidentially in the case of Hungary earlier this year. How did, then, is the line between the democratic liberal societies that we are supposedly living today and tyrannical ruling after observing draconian limitations to the freedom of movement of the people around the world during the pandemic, is the real-time and ever-changing discovery of scientific knowledge on the new coronavirus sufficient to allow populist government to throw democracy, democracy off, out of the window? Um. So, you know, that is that is the the question of the day in, in many respects in that, um, you know, that what is the what what is the, if you want to look for historical parallels in the in the older democracies, when when was it that we had um, uh, massive economic collapse, very high levels of unemployment, fragmented political parties? Uh, and the rise of populism, of course, it was in the 1930s. Um, it was, it was, uh, this is how um, Hitler and or Mussolini in the 20s in depression uh, and Hitler in the 30s came to power. Um, they exploited fragmentation in the, in the electoral s systems. They took advantage of dysfunctional legislatures and pushed for um, strong presidents and use that to upend democracy. And uh, that is the, the great danger that the world now confronts uh, and, and many of the older democracies confront. Um, and, uh, you know, th this is why we are doing the work we're doing uh, to try and argue that uh, the answer lies in the the opposite direction to the direction so many people are pushing it. Um, because the more you um, weaken political parties and make it impossible for them to govern, um, the more likely it is that strong men will eventually come along and just say, we don't need democracy at all. Um, and, you know, that that is uh, the as Americans say, the $64 million question, um, when does that come? Um, and where does it come? Uh, and it, it's, um, you know, who would have thought that a, a neo-Nazi party would be the, the third largest party in the Bundestag uh, and would be winning regional and local elections in Germany at such a, a rapid rate that, um, uh, you know, I don't know if you noticed in, in 2017 in Germany, uh, the SPD had decided to leave the Grand Coalition because all the compromises they had made were just making them lose voters and they decided to go into opposition. And Merkel spent seven months trying to put together a coalition with the libertarian free Democrats and the Greens, which you couldn't do because the Greens want environmental legislation and the and the free Democrats want no regulation. And so finally collapsed. And why did the social Democrats agree to come back into the government? Only because by the polls all showed that if the country went back to an election, the alternative for Deutschland would do even better, um, which indeed happened in the regional elections the following year. The, the, and the reason Germany hasn't had an election yet is everybody knows the AFD is going to do better um, and, you know, get to the point in some of these countries 
uh, in Holland. Everybody says that nobody will put them in the coalition. Uh, but eventually, if they get big enough, governments become at least implicitly dependent on them, if not explicitly dependent on them. And eventually, it'll it'll be impossible uh, not to include them. So unless you can think of ways to get uh, to strengthen legislatures so they can, it, you know, it's not rocket science. We know what what's driving these voters is massive long-term insecurity, uh, downward mobility, uh, losing things that they had or thought they were going to have. Um, we know from behavioral economics, from Kahneman and Tversky, that, that losing things is a much more potent political problem than not gaining things, right? This is why Trump's slogan was so effective. Make America great again implies something's been taken away from you and I'm going to bring it back. You know, Trump never said, I'm going to reduce inequality. He never said, I'm going to, like Reagan, I want a world where everybody can get rich. He never said, he never told people they're going to get rich. He said, I'm going to bring back those industrial jobs from China. That's what I'm going to do. That's what all he said he was going to do. And, you know, to the extent you get people believing that they, the things they have lost, the, the safe middle class or lifestyle that they have lost, um, that's what mobilizes them. It's much less inequality than insecurity. I'll just give you one more statistic. I know we're running short on time. Most people don't know this, that the the average income of a Trump voter, people are very shocked when they learn this, one third of Trump voters in the primaries, never mind in the general election when they had to choose just between him and Hillary, in the primaries when he was running against 17 Republican candidates, one third of the voters earned less than the median income, which is $150,000 for a family of four. One third earned between 50 and 100,000, and one third earned above 100,000. So two thirds of his supporters were above the median income. So it's not about poverty. What it's about is insecurity and downward mobility. Um, and unless a world is created in which people can have some uh, reduction in that insecurity, I think it's very difficult to imagine a scenario where we get away from the kind of politics that we've been seeing. Professor Shapiro, uh, thank you very much for your uh, answers and for your time. We are running out of the agreed time here, uh, but it was a really uh, insightful discussion. We have uh, learned a lot from your uh, points and we have other questions here, but uh, I think you have addressed some of the points that have uh, that people are raising here in the questions. Uh, we can forward these questions for you afterwards but in order to use to see what people were uh, having doubts about here in the discussion as well. Uh, but uh, uh, I would like to thank you for this uh, incredible uh, keynote address for our students and not only for the students of the University of Salvador that's hosting the, this event, but also for students from all over Brazil who are also attending uh, this online event. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and, uh, and for being here with us uh, today. So your final words, Professor. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, as I put up on the first slide, and I'm happy to send you the slides if you want them, what I said today is drawn from the domain lectures that I gave uh, at Yale last fall, 2019, and they're all up on YouTube. Uh, so if you just Google up Ian Shapiro, Yale, Devane, that's D-E-V-A-N-E -E lectures, um, there's, there's, it's, a, an, it's a whole course, so it's 26 lectures that was delivered over three months. But um, if you if you if you haven't had enough, uh, you can get some more there. Yes, I, I'm watching them. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah. I have forwarded this for my students to to watch as well because they're really incredible. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone who were, who were here today, Thank who joined us for this discussion. And uh, we hope we have a wonderful uh, fall semester here at University of Salvador. Thank you, Shapiro, once again. Have a good day. Thank you all. Thanks for coming.